So in this question called Mini, this is from the December 2012 P2 paper, we're initially asked to prepare the consolidated statement of financial position. So what I've done is I've set out my pro formas and my pro forma workings. There is always a case, I would say, in section A for doing part C of the question first, which is the ethics part, because there's eight marks going there and students can get very very high marks for the ethics part of the question so I'd really encourage you to make sure that you come up and come up aim to come up with eight points because broadly you're going to get one mark per valid point that you make so I've set out a pro forma consolidated statement of financial position with a group structure working net assets goodwill non-controlling interest reserves and associate it's our old friends okay I'm never I don't, I don't try to do anything too complicated and the first thing I'm going to try to do is to determine the group structure. So what do we have here? Well, we have Mini acquiring 70% of Bauer. And in due course, Bauer acquires... 80% of Heaney. So this gives us a vertical group. I'm now going to draw my little table for Bauer and Heaney and Mini has a direct investment of 70% in Bauer and it has an indirect investment in Heaney 70% times 80% 56% non-controlling interest 30% 44% So now we've got our allocation of profit. We can now start to work our way through. Oh, and there's one other investment. We've got Putin, 14% plus 16%. So Putin becomes an associate, and therefore we're going to use the equity accounting method to deal with Putin in due course. So the first thing that we see is PPE, and the other thing that I've done in respect of the question is that I've used the first 15 minutes, I've taken the additional information, and I've referenced it to the appropriate row in the question. So now I can see, as far as PPE is concerned, I've referenced that to note 6. As far as um, the investment in Bauer is concerned, I've referenced that to note 1. The, the investment in Heaney, I've referenced to note 2. So what I'm trying to do is trying to get a feel for the question for the extent of the adjustments that are likely going to be likely to be required. So we kick off and we got property, plant and equipment for our three group companies. All I'm going to do is under the single entity concept, I'm going to add these three together. So I'm sticking in a figure of 1530. Next, we've got our direct investment in Bauer. So I'm going to go to the goodwill calculation. Goodwill. So the direct cost is 730. We then have Bauer's investment in Heaney, where we have an indirect cost. And what is that indirect cost? Well, that is the total cost is 320. It made by Heaney. The group owns 70% of Heaney. So therefore, that gives me a figure of 224. The other 30% of the investment in Heaney is made by Bauer's non-controlling interest. So I'm going to pop down to my non-controlling interest working and say share of cost in Heaney 30% of 320 that's 96 negative next we've got the investment in Putin Putin's our associate I'm going to go to associates and simply say investment per statement of financial position is 48. Intangible assets 
If we add those together, that comes to 263. Current assets, add them together, and that comes to 1625. So don't try to overcomplicate the question all the time. Let's pick up whatever is available. When we come to share capital, the share capital of the parent is also the share capital of the group. So we take the 920 of the parent and put that directly onto the face of our statement of financial position. The share capital of our two subsidiaries forms part of their net assets. So we're going to do our net assets calculations at the SFP and the acquisition date, the SFP and the acquisition date. SC, perfectly acceptable for share capital. Okay, the marketing team are not going to go, or oh, SC, what could they possibly mean? Seashells, coconuts. No, they're not going to do that, are they? They just say, yeah, share capital. So, perfectly acceptable to abbreviate, and we've got 400, 400, 200, 200. Yeah, yeah. You, if you if you put PPE, you won't be marked down. Um, yeah, they're not. The examiner isn't asking for linguistic perfection. Next, we come to other components of equity. So go to reserves, and all I'm going to say, I've got the figures for the parent. Other components of equity, 73, retained earnings, 895. So let's just slot those straight in. Then we've got the figures for the subsidiary at the date of our statement of financial position. So I'm just going to slot those numbers in. Um, so therefore, for Bauer, 37 and 442. And for Heaney, 25 and 139. Non current liabilities, that's not reference to anything, so I'm simply going to add those up, put that in at 711. Okay. And current liabilities, I have referenced those to one of the notes, so I add those up, and that comes to 674. So those are our statements of financial position dealt with. Let's now take a look at the additional information. On the 1st of December, Mini acquired 70% of Bauer. The purchase consideration was cash of 730. We've dealt with that. At acquisition, the fair value of the NCI was 295. So I go to my NCI calculation. At acquisition, We've just established that that figure is 295, so that's 295 for Bauer in the NCI, and we're also putting that into our goodwill calculation. NCI at acquisition, 295. On the acquisition date, the fair value of the net assets was 835, so we go up to our net assets working. And we have a fair value of 835. And we're told at that date, OCE was 27 and retained earnings were 319. Now, this is the way the examiner traditionally gives us the information. The difference between adding up those numbers and the fair value must be our fair value adjustment. So it's, it's the gap figure. And we're told the excess is due to non-depreciable land. So I can work this out as a balancing figure of 89. When you put through an adjustment, you've got to think debits and credits. So what we've effectively done, we've credited the reserves 
of Bauer by 89 and I'm going to debit land of Bauer by 89. That way my adjustments will balance. So I go up to PPE plus 89 that's come from working number two. Note two on the 1st of December X1 so this is the following year Bauer acquired 80 percent for a cash consideration of 320 which we've dealt with. The fair value of 20% of the non-controlling interest was 72 million, 30% was 108, and 44% was 161. But if we go to our non, if we go to our working number one, can you see that the non-controlling interest have 44% of Heaney? So therefore, it's going to be that figure that's the appropriate figure. So I go to my non-controlling interest working at acquisition 161. And that figure also goes into my goodwill calculation. At acquisition, the net assets had a fair value of 362. So we're going to take an identical approach. We work out the fair value, which is 362. We then say, well, what were the reserves? OCE was 20. And retained earnings were 106. So we must have a fair value adjustment and that balancing figure is 36. That's the only way I can get my fair value total to add up. And that's the way the examiner will traditionally set out his information. I've credited reserves with 36 so I've got to debit something. What are we doing? We're debiting land. We're increasing the value of land plus 36 working number 2. So that's note 2 dealt with. Note 3, something to do with impairment testings and recoverable amount. I've got no idea what's taking place at this stage. And in fact, ladies and gentlemen, what you could have done, you could have worked through this question and you could have just put a, put a line through that note and you would have still have balanced. So don't stress about the things that we can't do. So all I'm going to say is I know that there's some impairment. I don't really know what the impairment is. Um, and for Bauer and for Heaney, I do know that we compare carrying amounts to recoverable amounts. But at this stage, all I'm going to do is to say, well, um, I've got assets worth 1425. and 604 I don't really know what to do so therefore I'm going to leave it I might come back to it later if I've got the time or if I've got the inclination note 4 Mini acquired 14% of Putin for cash of 18 million and we're accounting for this under IFRS 9 um, and was designated as fair value through OCI. That's fine. We then acquired a further 16% of patin for 27. 18 plus 27 gives me 45. An achieved significant influence. So patin is an associate from this date. The value of the original 14% was 21 million. So now the total value of my investment was 21 million for the original plus 27 for the new shares. That gives me 48. A quick look, we've already got 48. Now what you could do at this stage, but it's not mandatory, is that you could have switched. There, there's a gain, hasn't there? We originally bought the shares for 18 and um, they've been revalued to 21. So what we could have done is we could have taken that gain out of OCE and put it into retained earnings. But it's not necessary to do that. If it's not necessary, don't do it, is my view. So I'm, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to keep my life as simple as I can. Putin made profits after tax of 20 million and 30 million in X1 and X2 respectively. Well, 
let's look at dates. Remember I said to you how important dates are. How long has Putin been an associate? He's been an associate for six months. So I'm going to go to my associate working and say share of profits since acquisition. Sorry, since associate. So our share of profits is 30%. Putin has made profits for the year ended the 30th of November X2 of 30 million and it has been an associate for six months of that period. So that gives me a figure of 4.5. So that's the profits we've earned. It then says Mini received a dividend from Putin of 2 million which has been credited to OCE. So what I'm going to do here, that dividend is going to reduce the value of my investment because it's cash being received. So what do I do? I go debit cash credit investment in associate. So this is our dividend received. So therefore our actual share of our share of retained profits is 2.5. It says in the question that that dividend has been credited to OCE. Well, dividends should go to Statement of Profit and Loss, shouldn't they? So what, what the company has done is incorrect. So I'm going to pop up here and say Divi from Associate. I'm going to take it out of OCE and I'm going to put it into Retained Earnings. And I'm also going to say share of retained profits of associate from working number six. It's the 4.5 less the two. Because it's the see, your share of retained earnings, where retained earnings is share of profit less dividends. Think about the statement of changes in equity. We've got profits less dividends. So you must always take out your dividends from the scenario. Note 5. Mini purchased patents. That's quite difficult to say that, isn't it? Mini purchased patents. It's a tongue twister. Of 10 million to use in a project to develop new products and we've had some extra work done in relation to those products. So I'm going to have working number 8 in respect of intangibles and here we've got some work and clearly what the examiner is doing is he's testing us on the standard in relation to intangibles can we identify which of those costs should be capitalized and which should be written off it says in the note all of the above costs are included in the intangible assets of mini well in respect of that the purchase patents, that's fine. Um, we've completed the investigative phase of the project. That's research, isn't it? So the following costs should be expensed. So we've got the investigative, the investigative work, and how much was that? That's seven million. Um, an effective and working prototype at a cost of four million. That's development work. That's fine. Um, and in order to put the product into a condition for sale, that's completing the development that's a further three minutes that's acceptable finally marketing costs well marketing costs are nothing to do with development so marketing 
2. So therefore what we need to do is that we need to remove 9 million from intangible assets That's come from working seven, that's working eight. And what am I doing? I'm crediting intangibles. I need to debit something. I've normally charged those expenses to profit or loss. And therefore, let's go to profit or loss. Working number five. Intangibles from working number eight. 9 million to knock off against retained earnings. Note 6, Mini intends to dispose of a major line of the parent's business. The held for sale criteria were met. So this is an IFRS 5 issue, non-current assets held for sale and disposal groups. So I'm going to set up another working say held for sale what do we have well we've got PPE of 49 we've got inventories of 18 and we've got current liabilities of 3 that adds up to 64 million the recoverable amount is 30 so therefore the impairment is 34 so what we need to do is that these assets we're going to remove from the statement of financial position we're going to take out these assets and we're going to put in our non-current assets held for sale and there's an impairment of 34 million well that impairment is written off against profit so go up to working number five held for sale impairment from working number nine I'm going to reduce my profits by 34. Now, there's a lot to do here. So I'm reducing my profits by 34. I'm reducing PPE by 49. I'm reducing current assets because that's where I hold my inventories by 18. I'm reducing current liabilities by three and then I'm going to put in where do non-current assets held for sale appear in the accounts they appear separately below current assets so I'm going to say non-current assets held for sale now if you stick in a figure of 30 that's perfectly acceptable strictly it should be the 30 plus the liabilities so I'm going to stick in 33 into assets and then I'm going to show the liabilities in the liabilities section of my statement of financial position so go below current liabilities liabilities held for sale three shouldn't really net it off but if, if you have netted it off and stuck in a figure of 30 you wouldn't have lost much okay it's so it says no adjustments have been made so We've adjusted the assets, we've adjusted the liabilities, and we've adjusted the profits. So there's a lot taking place there. 
we've now dealt with all of the additional information. And remember, we've got 63 minutes in the exam, and we've taken 25 so far. Once you've dealt with all the information in the question, go to working number two, your net assets working, and let's crunch through those numbers. The fair value of the net assets at the SFP date is 968, and for Heaney, it's 400. So therefore, Heaney's net assets have increased by 38, but we split that. We can say that the OCE has gone up by 5, and retained earnings have gone up by 33. For Bauer, OCE has gone up by 10, and retained earnings Those have increased as well, and those have increased by 1, 2, 3. We use working number 2 to drive through all of our remaining figures. So for goodwill, we say less net assets at acquisition. And for Bauer, that's 835, and for Heaney, that's 362, which gives us goodwill totals of 190 and 23. I'm not going to put those into my statement of financial position yet, because I'm a little bit nervous about that impairment, because I know that when impairments take place under IAS, we normally impair goodwill first. Let's now go to the non-controlling interest, and I'm going to give them their share since acquisition. Now for Bauer, it's 30, the, the non-controlling interest, they don't care whether it's other comprehensive equity or it's retained earnings. They just want their 30%. So for Bauer, it's going to be 30% of 133, which gives me a figure of 39.9. And for Heaney, it's going to be 44%. How much have profits risen? Profits have risen by... 38. And that gives me a rather nasty number of 16.72. If you work to the nearest one decimal place, that's fine. Expect to see a few nasty numbers in the exam. Okay, Things aren't going to work out to round figures all the time. If we're going to give those profits to the NCI, we give the remaining profits to the parent, or the group, should we say. Share of sub since acquisition. Now for Bauer, it's 70%, and the group, it does matter. It's 10 and 1, 2, 3. So we're going to give them 7 for other comprehensive income, and 70% of 1, 2, 3 gives us 86.1. For Heaney, it's 56% of 5 and 33. So that gives us a figure of 2.8 for other comprehensive income and 18.48 for retained earnings. So that's dealt with all of the information. The only thing that is outstanding is this issue of the impairment. So if you didn't do the impairment and you ba and you added everything up at this stage, you should balance. But what are we doing here? Let's just go back to note number three. I said if we had time, and it looks like we've got time, we can go through this. Both Bauer and Heaney were impairment tested, 
and we're given the recoverable amounts of the cash generating units. Now the cash, gener cash generating units are only the assets. So what do we have? Well I'm going to take the assets per the statement of financial position. So let's take a look at Bauer. We go back to Bauer. Bauer has total assets of 1130 and Heaney has total assets of 595. But that is at carrying amount. On top of that, remember we've put through a fair value adjustment and that fair value adjustment was 89 for Bauer and 36 for Heaney. Do those companies have any other assets? Well, remember they have goodwill. So we have to add in goodwill as well. And goodwill is 190 for Bauer and 23 for Heaney. So this was a, this is quite an unpleasant adjustment to expect people to make. If I add those up, that gives me figures of 1409 for Bauer and for Heaney it works out as 654. Now you only put through an impairment if your recoverable amount is less than the carrying amount. So for Bauer the recoverable amount is higher than the carrying amount, so no impairment is required. For Heaney, the recoverable amount is 50 less, <laughs> so we have an impairment of 50 to put through. What is the order in which we appear assets? It's goodwill first. So the goodwill of Heaney is 23. So I'm going to impair the goodwill of Heaney by 23 from working number 9. You take goodwill down as far as you can go. And then the excess, what does it say in the question? The directors of Mini felt that any impairment of assets was due to the poor performance of the intangible assets. So the intangible assets are going to be impaired by 27. So I'm going to reduce the value of intangibles by 27. So let's go up to intangibles minus 27 from working number 9. So I've reduced at one asset in the form of goodwill, so I've credited goodwill and I've credited intangibles. We now have to work out what are we going to charge. It's here, it's essential that we know and we review the method used to calculate the NCI. If you use the partial method, the goodwill impairment is allocated against group reserves. If you use the fair value method, the goodwill impairment is split between the group and the NCI. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is a nerd point. Okay. I know that because I am a nerd. I don't expect people to remember nerd points. But what I can now do is go up to the NCI and say their share of the impairment, well the impairment was 50, and Heaney had 44%, so that works out as 22 negative, 
and for the parent share of impair that's going to be 56% of 50 which is 28 So I'm going to write it down by 28, like so. We're now in a position to do our housekeeping. We're going to work out our final totals. Yep. The, the impairment of Heaney has to be split. Now, because we're using the fair value method to calculate goodwill, we split it purely between the NCI and the group. If you use the proportionate method to determine goodwill, it is only the group which suffers the impairment for goodwill, and then the impairment for the other assets is split between the group and the NCI. That's a nerd point. I don't want you to remember it. Okay? It's 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 too obscure. But does it only say you have to split? Does it only mean you have to split? Yeah. When, when you have impairment. Yeah. So we can now work out our totals. So as far as goodwill is concerned, there's no good impairment for Bauer. So we can take the goodwill of Bauer and take 190 to our consolidated statement of financial position. When it comes to the NCI, a couple of unpleasant adjustments to put through. We can work out our totals. 238.9 for Bauer and for Heaney 155.72. Add those two together 394.62. I'm going to take that figure and transfer that to equity. And that's come from working number four. Let's add up our group reserves. For OCE, I've got 80.8. And for retained earnings, I've got 933. 0.08. Let's transfer those in. Other components of equity 80.8 .8 from working 5, retained earnings 933.08 from working 5. Current liabilities are 671. Now, in the exam, do not add up your statement of financial position. You get no marks for it, and the chances are it's not going to balance. But if you do, it should add up to 3713.5. PPE. Add up PPE. 1606. We've got intangibles. A 229 and we've got our investment in the associate which we'll pick up from working number six and in working number six that adds up to 50.5 Current assets, add those across. 1607. Now comes the knees trembling, eyes closed part of the question. Get out your calculators. 3713.5. And we're balanced. Could just be luck. You know, if so, I'm going to buy a lottery ticket tonight. <laughs>